We had two machine guns who had set up off to my right flank. They started firing, and we fired, and my squad fired and maneuvered back to where the platoon was at and just got married up with the platoon when uh, the, the main part of the force hit us and started firing. And we ended up uh, losing the platoon leader, platoon sergeant, uh, weapon squad leader, uh, artillery FO, uh, mortar FO, all within about the first five minutes of, of the battle. And it was a very intense fire back and forth uh, there for about 20, 30 minutes initially, Tim. And uh, the, art, the, uh, the mortar FO guy had come around to my flank and he got hit and killed, got hit in the head. And he had a, he had a radio, he had dropped the handset for the radio and he was trying to get artillery in. And uh, I tried to reach over the log and get it, but when I did that, all kind of fire started hitting the log where the NVA was firing at me. And I had to reach under the log. I reached under the log and pulled the handset and started adjusting the artillery. And I adjusted the artillery around us and all the fire is going on at this time, back and forth, very intense. It, it, it was so loud you could hardly think clearly. When you get in an intense battle like that, your training takes over. Your adrenaline gets high, your fear is basically could go. I, my experience in Vietnam was, you're afraid right before it happens, but once it starts, then your adrenaline takes over. And you're, you're more like you're, you're not really there, you're outside looking at what you're doing, and your training takes over and you do what you're, you're trying to do. You are about to embark upon the great crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. I was born in uh, Alabama, raised there as well. And had there been a history of military service in your family? Yes, I had uh, three, three brothers who served in the Marine Corps, Air Force, and Army. Well, you guys covered the branches pretty well. Got them all, yeah. <laughs> um, when did you join the service and why did you choose the Army? I joined in 60, 1962. I was originally going to go into Air Force, but the guys that are, I was going with uh, couldn't pass the test. So we all, we all went in the uh, Army together. Nice. Uh, where did you do your training? I did my basic training at Fort Riley, Kansas. And at what point did you have the opportunity to serve in this emerging Air Cavalry Division? I served in Korea in 62, 63. And when I came out of Korea, uh, I came to Fort Benning and joined the Eleventh Air Assault Test. And that's where they were testing the air assault concept for the Army. Explain, explain the concept. The concept was in, uh, instead of riding around on wheel or track vehicles or jumping out of the air and walking, uh, we went from uh, point A to point B on helicopters. So they transport you very quickly. Uh, you get up and move out quickly and you wouldn't, uh, you were, wouldn't wore out for walking. <laughs> However, we did walk quite a bit. People thought we flew everywhere, but we did do quite a bit of walking. How did you train for that before you were in combat? When you're here in the States testing this concept, what does that look like? Well, basic infantry training on the ground is the same. You know, you're trained as a, your, your squad and platoon, company, company level type of operation, battalion level type of operation. The concept of what the air cab was that you move everybody by helicopter. And in our test, we tested against the 82nd Airborne and the Fort Bragg. And uh, of course, once they got jumped out of the plane, they had to walk. And we could move from point A to point B at a snap of your finger. Uh, so we would always show up where we weren't supposed to be. So we gave them a pretty hard time in the, in the tests. So were you trying to perfect how quickly you could unload and load and take off and land and that sort of thing? Yeah, you could, you could go into places you know, where wheel vehicles couldn't go. And uh, later on in Vietnam, this paid off because you know, you could fly over to the jungle and drop down where the enemy was hiding, uh, and it would be very difficult to determine where you were coming from or when you were coming. And the same, with, that's the way it worked as well in the tests. What kind of helicopters were you using and how many guys could fit on there? 
we were uh, using the Huey, UH-1 helicopter. You could pretty well fit a squad on there w with equipment, and that depended also on the weather. If it was really hot, you, uh, that helicopter couldn't pick up as, as much weight as it could if it was cooler. But you, you could normally put a nine-man squad on there with equipment. When did you first deploy to Vietnam? We, we were deployed to Vietnam in August of 1965. Uh, we went over by ship. We landed Quang An Bay in Vietnam. That's where most of the ship stuff were coming in at the time. And then we went from there to An K, which was our base camp. This video is sponsored by 4Patriots.com. 4Patriots has made it their mission to ensure that we are all prepared for any situation or environment. No matter what situation you find yourself in, you can trust that 4Patriots will have your back. ABC has this crazy, team member that likes to go out in the mountains and run for days and days and days. So in his base camp, he wants some quick and easy electricity. He regularly uses the Patriot Power Generator 2000X when he's out in the mountains and in other obscure locations. That power pack uses the endless free power of the sun to power your lights, your TV, medical equipment, or even your fridge. Plus it's expandable and comes with a free solar panel. We had the folks at 4Patriots set up a special page for you at 4Patriots.com forward slash ABC so you can see any deals or any specials that they're running at this time. Go to 4Patriots.com forward slash ABC to support this video. So the, the fighting that we're going to be talking about at X-Ray is November of 1965, but give us a little bit of the background that led up to this mission. What was happening that your commanders felt that you needed to respond there? Well, Play Me uh, uh, Special Forces Camp was under siege by the North Vietnamese Army. And it, it was basically uh, uh, a siege they didn't really want to take the, 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 the outpost, but they wanted to uh, ambush the reinforcements coming in. And basically what happened on there, there was a mech, there was a mech avenue, to, it had American advisors with it, who knew basically what the ploy was that they were pulling. And so they, they were ready for artillery and air support. And when they sprung the ambush, they pretty well wiped out the Indian VA ambushing units. And uh, we knew about that. And uh, before we went into X-ray itself, we were in a security of, of, the, uh, of the brigade headquarters uh, for a couple of days. And uh, then we moved from there to play me count uh, where we stayed to go into LZ X-ray. So we'd been out about a week or so of training, uh, uh, patrolling uh, before we went into X-ray. So explain the plan. The plan basically, from what I understood from the operation orders was, you know, we knew that the NVA was somewhere out there. They didn't know exactly where they were. We knew they were, they were withdrawing from their attack on Play Me. We found out later, though, there were a lot of new units that came in we weren't, we weren't aware of. So we were more or less like a search destroy type operation. We were going into that area. They thought they were where they were located at. The, the NVA was located there, but we, we wasn't sure exactly what was going on for us. That was concerned. Tell us a little bit about your leader, Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore. He was a great leader, tactically and technically proficient. And, and a very good personality. He would get right down in the trenches with you and talk on your level. And uh, his leadership was superb. Uh, he, he, he implemented a lot of things that uh, and improved, uh, uh, improved the training for, for us and, and the leadership training specifically. He had one program to call for drop out your dead, basically. He could walk up to a leader and kill him, say you're dead, and then, you know, uh, there had to be somebody prepared to jump in that position. Because once you're dead, of course, you can't say anything. So uh, we're always trained from the lowest level up, at least one or two levels up that we could take over if we had to. Okay, so let's uh, get to that day now. This is uh, mid-November of 1965. Um, explain what happened as you landed and, and began there. Well, first of all, when we, we came from uh, Security for Brigade, we flew into Play Me Camp, which had been under siege. 
We flew in there on with Chinook helicopters. And when we got off the helicopters, there was a big pile of trash, which we thought was trash. And when we walked by, we realized that it was Vietnam, North Vietnamese Army soldiers who had been pulled, who had been pulled up out of the wire and around the camp and been piled up in position to have a mass burial. So that itself, you know, uh, alerted you to, hey, things are a little different than what you're used to, because the only thing we had come in contact with before was the gorillas in the black in the black pajama suits. These guys were different, they were, they were professionals. When we flew out of there on, on the Huey helicopters, I can remember as we approached the LZ, I could see the smoke coming off of it. Because the Hueys, when we first fly out like that, we fly at a higher level, maybe 5,000 feet in the air, and you can see a long ways. But when you start approaching to the LZ, they drop down to what was called treetop level. And basically, they're at the treetops. You're doing 160 knots at the treetops. In training, you know, every once in a while, they, they, the branches would hit the bottom of the skids or the helicopter, you know, and it would scare the hell out of you. But uh, going into the LZ, you know, uh, we weren't too concerned about the limbs because we, we could see what was going on for the smoke uh, off the LZ on the prep fire. And then when we landed, nothing happened. When we, we went in the machine guns, uh, the, the door gunners were firing into the sides of the, off the sides of the LZ, which had, that was a, that was a SOP to do that. And then we jumped out of the helicopter and ran out to the edges of the, of the LZ like you should to secure it. And the helicopters took off and then it was dead silence, not anything. Nobody fired around, nothing really quiet. So uh, nothing was going on at, at that time for about 10 to 15 minutes. I know we were sitting there just waiting and two of our platoons had been sent off towards the mountain. We were only one company on the ground at the time, Bravo Company, John Heron's company. And uh, my platoon was still sort of held back. And the, the two platoons that went out made contact with NVA soldiers coming off of Chupong Mountain. Captain Heron sent my platoon up to, to uh, hook up to the right side of the first platoon. So uh, Lieutenant Herrick got us up and we, we took off up to, to cover the right flank of the first of the first platoon. And by the time we approached the first platoon, then uh, Lieutenant Herrick turned the platoon and chased off what I found out later was NVA soldiers. Cause I was a trail squad, so I didn't really know what was going on up front. I knew that we were going where we shouldn't be going. And that we were going away from the company itself. And so we went up five, six hundred yards up there, and uh, as we come up on the little knoll, we run head on into a unit coming down the valley. In, uh, NVA or was probably an NVA battalion. We weren't sure. We didn't know what it was. The ter first two squads went down and took them under fire, and I was the trail squad, and me and machine guns flanked. I fl went out front and flanked the enemy. We actually flanked the enemy and fired on them before they fired on us. And then you had to be, then I, I looked and I seen like two platoons of NVA flanking, trying to flank us to the right. They wasn't firing, they were just moving quickly to the right, trying to get into our flank. And about that time, uh, uh, the machine guns, we had two machine guns who had set up off to my right flank. They started firing and we fired, and my squad far maneuvered back to where the platoon was at and just got married up with the platoon when uh, the, the main part of the force hit us and started firing. And we ended up uh, losing the platoon leader, platoon sergeant, uh, weapon squad leader, uh, artillery FO, uh, mortar FO, all within about the first five minutes of, of the battle. And it was a very intense fire back and forth uh, there for about 20, 30 minutes initially, Tim. And uh, the, art, the, uh, the mortar FO guy had come around to my flank and he got hit and killed, got hit in the head. And he had a, he had a radio, he had dropped the handset for the radio and he was trying to get artillery in. And uh, I tried to reach over the log and get it, but when I did that, all kind of fire started hitting the log 
and view it was firing at me. And I had to reach under the log. I reached under the log and pulled the handset and started to adjust the artillery. And I adjusted the artillery around us and all fires going on at this time, back and forth, very intense. It, it, it was so loud you could hardly think clearly. There's so much ammunition being fired out. And I finally, trying to get the artillery adjusted in, and when I was giving them to do a gun target line, not a gun target, uh, observer target line, they couldn't adjust that. But I could hear the artillery firing in the distance. So I went to a gun target line, which means I know where you're firing from, and I know where you're firing to, then my adjustments will be from that. And so I, I, I made the adjustment based on the gun target line and quickly got the artillery in around us and I called in very close ar ar around the uh, where, where we were at. So close one time that when they, they fired for effect, a couple of rounds fell on the ups opposite side of where they were firing, firing at. But uh, the main thing was the artillery saved us there. And we kept the artillery going all, all afternoon. Uh, and I set up uh, uh, target reference points all around the perimeter and they logged those on, at the artillery site. So later on when I had to call for artillery, I would just call for that target reference point and I could get a fire for effect, that's all the gun firing at one time on that point. So we fought most of that afternoon and then it started backing off a little bit around five o'clock in, in the afternoon. We were still getting people firing back and forth, but the most intense part took place for probably 35 to 40 minutes, you know, but then we had killed a whole lot of them and they had, they had also killed a whole lot of us. But uh, they took my artillery that afternoon because the LZ was under attack. But the whole time I never remember hearing the artillery firing on the LZ or the small arms fire from the LZ, I guess because the artillery was so close that it, it hurt my ears. I know I can hardly hear it now anyway, but I think it just before it drowned it out, everything I was hearing other than right around me. But during the night, they run into us a couple times during the night, either deliberately or by accident, and there was a short fire fight and they would back off because I would have called the artillery on them. And then uh, I know that a major unit was losing down the bottom about three o'clock in the morning and they stopped right at one of my reference points, one of my target reference points. And I called a fire for effect on that, and I think they fired 12 guns on that. They fired a lot of artillery. So they killed a lot of those folks that was coming down that bottom. And uh, they had tried to reach us a couple of times the afternoon, the day before, uh, but they, they, they weren't, weren't able to get anywhere near us. I never seen them, never heard them. Uh, but they lost a few people trying to get to us. I do remember that. And then uh, the next morning they called and said they were coming in. I think the, a battalion of the 1st to 5th Cal had came in and some of the 2nd and 7th Cal had came in and then they left the LZ and came up and got us. They got us about 11 o'clock the next morning, about 11 o'clock. And uh, we had lost eight KIAs out of the platoon. That was a platoon of 27 people there. Of the 27 people, one was a company medic, one was a artillery forward observer, one was a mortar forward observer. So three of them didn't even belong to the platoon. So we had a fighting force of only 24 people. Basically what was doing, well everybody's fighting, but only 24 people actually belonged to the platoon. But they, they got us about 11 o'clock and it took just about the whole company to move all of the wounded and dead back to the LZ. What, how did you go over what had happened? How did you dissect it and, and learn from it and figure out what to do the next time you're in well, the situation? I don't think there's a whole lot of dissecting to do to it, you know, and figure out what you're going to do next time. You realize, you know, that the training we had had paid off greatly and that we were still alive. Most of us were, were still alive. But then uh, uh, we had all those people who were not killed who 
Leros. That means they were getting discharged from the army. A lot of those people killed there were supposed to be discharged from the army in about two weeks. Because they were draftees, two, two year guys. And we'd been training with them 18 months or so. So most of them were, were, were ready to, to rotate out, would have rotated out uh, if we came back from that mission without hitting LZ X ray. Most of those guys were killed, would have went home. But then the, the ones that weren't killed or wounded, majority of those did rotate out. Once we get back to base camp, I had a, we had nobody left in the platoon, and very few people left in the company. So we uh, we had to have not they all were killed or anything like that you know, or wounded, but they were discharged from the army. So we had to take a group of a new people in, integrated them, and train them. But we used our experience in training and our experience in what we had went through and how we trained those people. And so we, we did have a few of the good NCOs left. We had a lot of them that were killed. And in my platoon, the two of the major ones were the platoon sergeant and the weapon squad leader. And the other rest of them were wounded. Uh, so I was one of the NCOs left that went over originally. We didn't have that many. So we had to uh, help integrate the new NCOs in, the new ones we were getting, and uh, as well as uh, train the new people we had. We had. How soon were you back in action? We trained those guys probably a month or so, off and on, but we were still out there playing with the, with the VC. We call them trainers, training op four, which was, cause they can shoot as well as the regular guys. But in January, we went to Bong Son, which was along the coast, mostly rice paddies. We run into NVA down there also. We, we were in uh, Bong Son for 45 days straight. And just about every, every day, we were in contact, making contact with, with the enemy. Sometimes we'd fight them four or five hours, and they would take, it'd get dark, and it would take off, and we would jump on the helicopters and catch them 10 to 15 minutes. I remember saying, damn, let them go for a while. You know? But yeah, we were 45 days there, and we lost quite a few people there as well. And I, I found out one thing from that, you know, the old vets we had left, we probably didn't lose any more of those guys. So experience makes a difference in combat. If you experience combat, your chances of survival are much greater. And if you're with the well-trained unit, your chances of survival are much greater when everybody knows what they're doing. But if you got new guys and if something happens, they don't know exactly what to do, they hesitate or they do the wrong thing, and that causes them to get killed or get hit. And that proves itself very well in Bong Son. So the story of Landing Zone X-Ray and, and Aya Drang is an incredibly powerful story, but it really became well known thanks to the book that Colonel Moore and eventually General Moore wrote with Joe Galloway. So what's it like to have what you lived become a very well-read story and then turn into a movie? And so your story becomes a story that a lot of people know. Well, when the book first came out, you know, uh, I read the whole book, which in, the book itself includes Atlanta's on Albany as well. LZ X was just one part of that, of that battle. You know, and the book is probably 90, 95% true, because they interviewed everybody that was in the fights, uh, and so the information they wrote the book on is based on actual memories of the guys that fought it. Now, the movie itself is probably 70% accurate as far as uh, historical is, is concerned, and the rest of it's 30 percent is Hollywood. You know, there's a lot of things they show it in Hollywood. And the other thing on the, uh, on the movie is uh, they take a three-day fight and they try to put it into two hours. When you do that, everybody's fighting all the time, you know. Uh, and uh, yeah, to have it historical account of what happened, you know, and and you're very proud of the people who, who were there with you. And uh, that includes uh, Joe Galloway and General Moore for, for actually doing the book itself. Because uh, I think it's one of the most accurate books done at the time. And the movie itself was as well, because a lot of the movies were strictly based on, on uh, what Hollywood thought was going on in Vietnam. And this movie was based on an actual book telling what went on 
and of course they took the Hollywood license to change it the way they thought it should, so they sell sell more for hit tickets, I imagine. So, uh, as you look back at your career, um, what are you most proud of, both in that operation and throughout your 20 years in, in the service? Well, I'm proud of that outfit, you know, and anybody who served with it will tell you that. And uh, the first seven has stayed together, General Moore's battalion, as far as reunions, better than I think any other battalion. We've had we had we had close to 200 people show up at our last reunion we had in in uh, in, in Georgia. I'm very proud to serve with that unit. I'm very proud to 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 done a career in the army. I would have I wouldn't have changed anything that I've done. 